In fact, the opioid crisis is a good business model. This is the third video I've done on this topic. The last two were chronic pain simplified, how to become pain-free naturally, and how the opioid crisis is a misunderstood pain crisis. So we know there's a crisis because we hear it in the news. The NIH tells us uh, that we have an opioid crisis. Now, for those who are not in the field, you might not understand or realize that uh, the opioid crisis has been going on forever. <laughs> it's like, since, well, I can't say since recorded history, but for several hundred years. So I'll show you that in a couple of seconds. So first, this is back in 1989. I pulled this out of my library to look at the top medications that were prescribed uh, in, this would be 1988. And it shows us uh, back in, 83, 84, 85, 86, and look at what where opiates were, number one all those years. Opiates have been, so you see Tylenol with codeine, opiates have been a th the biggest selling, most prescribed medication uh, in America for four decades. What about recently? Still in the top 10, here you can see codeine again with Tylenol again. So this is number eight right now. So you know, when did this modern era of, uh, of, of increasing opiate prescriptions occur? It appears we can trace it back to 1990 when, Ronick, uh, when Ronald Melzack, a famous pain researcher, wrote this article for Scientific American, The Tragedy of Needless Pain, where he said, that morphine uh, combating, combating back pain is a good idea. We should prescribe it more and use it efficaciously, but use it more because of the, the tragedy of needless pain. Uh, and the idea that, well, morphine used carefully is not addictive, but who uses stuff carefully, really? Uh, average person tends not to fall into that direction. But what happened as a consequence of, look at this language, the tragedy of needless pain. Anyone else use this language? Let's see. Ah, Georgetown University Law Center addressing the global tragedy of needless pain. What was the purpose of this article, 2008? To promote wider accessibility uh, of opiates on the international front. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. See, the opioid crisis is clearly a good business model. How do we know this for sure? Well, recently, the New Yorker magazine published an article about the Sackler family that made billions, billions, not millions, like Dr. Eva would say, billions. So what are we told in this article? Upon its release in 1995, OxyContin, medical breakthrough, long-lasting narcotic, allegedly not addicted. We know that that's not true. How much did the Sacklers, this is a privately owned drug company, how much did they make? <laughs> Generated $35 billion. Dr. Ebel could only dream of such an incredible business model. So this is an approved business model. Between 2006, 2006 and 2015, Purdue and other painkiller producers along with their other nonprofits, spent nearly 900 million, million, 900 million dollars, almost a billion, on lobbying and political contributions, dominating, crushing the gun lobby. So that's an approved business model, just for kicks. Think about what is unapproved. If you are a pair of sisters who want to take your father to... Splash Kingdom for Father's Day. This is an unapproved business model. The cops shut down the girls' illegal lemonade stand because they didn't have a permit. I think the permit was like 150 bucks, and all they wanted to do was raise $100 to take their father to Splash Kingdom. Unapproved. An unapproved model of business. Sorry, little girls. Now, if we trace back in history in the U.S., you can see this is a, was published in the Washington Post October 17th of last year. Teddy Roosevelt to Trump. 
How Drug Companies Triggered an Opioid Crisis a Century Ago. Who did this? How Drug Companies Triggered How Drug Companies Triggered an Opioid Crisis a Century Ago. But it goes back way before that. It goes back to the Opium Wars. It goes back to the Opium Wars. We'll talk about that in a couple seconds. So in 1908, Teddy Roosevelt approved <laughs> appointed a handsome Ohio doctor with a handlebar mustache, Hamilton Wright, to be the nation's first opium commissioner. What did he say back one, over 100 years ago? We have become in America the greatest drug fiends in the world. So the crisis has never ended in America. And it goes back, as I said, to the opium wars. In fact, you can see how the Brits essentially wiped out China. You can see how the Opium War crushed out China, and this goes back to the uh, 1800s. And it traces back even to the 1700s, the, how, how, how opium has been big business, big business. And more articles talk about it. You know, the opioid history from wonder drug to abuse epidemic. What are we told here? The abuse of opioids, prescription painkillers like heroin, something the United States has struggled with since before the 1900s. It's a problem that keeps coming back, though. Well, of course, because it's good business. So what will be the outcome of this current uh, business surge for the opium crisis? What do I think will happen? Well, if you look at history when it comes to these types of things, my suspicion is that we are being set up for a new, a new pain medication that will save us from the crisis. What historical evidence might I have to suggest that this will be the scenario? Well, if we go back to March 26, 1990, this was the cover of Newsweek magazine. Prozac, a breakthrough drug for depression. Now, Prozac works on the, uh, the brain serotonin system. So note the date on the top right, March 26, 1990. It turns out that the FDA banned tryptophan, the precursor for serotonin, which was a widely used supplement back in the 80s. Uh, they banned it on March 22nd, and then the breakthrough medication Prozac appeared on Newsweek in uh, four days later coincidence you think no you can read about it here if you want you can google around and find this but but the but the issue why tryptophan was brand, was banned was because 1411 cases of eosinophilia, eosinophilia myalgia syndrome uh, emerged and 19 deaths took place it turns out that the history goes is that it was a, a tainted batch from outside the u.s so all you would have had to do then of course was just ban imports of tryptophan and the problem would have been solved but no we're going to ban tryptophan because it is a good business model. So in this context, what would be, since the opioid situation is getting out of hand, we need a good business model, what are we going to do? We are going to create, and thanks to Newsweek, here we see, in 12, uh, December 2nd, 2017, Newsweek tells us the FDA has just approved an injectable opioid to help fight America's drug crisis. Buprenorphine is the medication. And um, some may know it as being used as part of this uh, medication from the Pharmaceutical Journal, Suboxone. So buprenorphine and naloxone are in combination. And there are other medications as well. The FDA is just as it from JAMA. You can, I Googled it, and this was the link. So they just fast-tracked a non-opioid medication, tenazumab. <laughs> These, the, the, the MAB drugs are often hard to say, depending upon the pronunciation. So what does ten, tenazumab do? It is a nerve growth factor inhibitor. And of course, this will make no sense to you if you don't know much about pain physiology. But one of the mechanisms that happens is that in the periphery, when there's an inflammatory event, the pain nerves, the pain nerve cells are called the, the pain neurons. They're called nociceptors. They, they take up locally produced nerve growth factor, and they transport the nerve growth factor up toward an area near the spinal cord called the dorsal root ganglia, and then it changes uh, the expression and the activity of neurons in the spinal cord that augments the experience of pain. So blocking nerve growth factor is not a bad idea, of course, but eh, better ways to do this, I think. So 
uh, this is the medication, and, and, and the, the, the opioid injectable, and here is the non-opioid that are going to help us with the crisis. So to show you how this is good business, this was published in 2016. They're looking at uh, tenazumab <laughs> for knee OA, so osteoarthritis of the knee. Look what we're told. You can see how the price varied, 200 to 1000 bucks a pop. There it is. That is good business. So I was not kidding when I was saying that the opioid crisis is a good business model. So the thing about this is that it's a business model, uh, and it's good business, but it's not one that, 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 that you or anyone you know needs to participate in unless they want to. So my suggestion is to watch these two previous videos that I created, and the Chronic Pain Simplified video included this image that shows the pain system in a very simplistic kind of fashion. I should not say simplistic, simple, because it's as accurate, it's just not, it's just not, this is simplistic typically means not accurate so uh, or, or less accurate. This is quite accurate. So it turns out that these are lifestyle choices that we make that influences how our body produces inflammatory chemistry outside the nervous system and inside the nervous system. So a lack of exercise, lack of sleep stress, dietary flaming, and, the, and an elevated body mass index all turn on the flame. These are all modifiable lifestyle factors that we have control over. So if one wants to avoid pain, now the other, the other issue is that we can get injured and this can happen, so we want to be anti-inflammatory before we get injured. And even if we do get injured, we can choose proper lifestyle choices to turn the flame off. My focus of this channel is, and my website is of course, overeating. And so this is a beautiful image of Big Daddy on the couch who's flaming away. So my suggestion from a nutritional perspective to help turn the flame off and get after this, this really this chronic pain crisis is to get rid of these calories out of the diet and replace them with vegetation. And this is all nicely, simply described in the Deflame Diet. And Chapter 9 describes how the body's pain system is brought closer to threshold with inflammatory chemistry. It's an easy read, so pick up a copy of the book and you can set yourself free from this aspect of the chronic pain crisis from which Americans suffer.